Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Everything Dog Training with me, John McGuigan, Glasgow Dog Trainer and Behaviour Consultant. Welcome back if you're a repeat uh, listener and thank you for taking a chance on us and hopefully you'll find this information beneficial if you are a first time listener. So welcome, welcome to all of you. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to listen to me and I hope you're having a great day or if it's not a a good day, the least amount of horrible that it can be or things start to improve. Okay, so before we start, can you do me a massive favour? Um, if your dog is with you, can you just uh, look at your dog, smile at them, uh, give them a little uh, some massage or some petting, okay, tell them how much you love them and how awesome that they are and how much your life has improved, even if it's in some little way, if you've got a problem child dog, uh, and how much they enrich your life. Uh, so just take a few seconds to uh, reflect on that. Our dogs are not with us for a long time, far too short a period, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, it's taking these moments to reflect on how cool our dogs are, uh, even when sometimes <laughs> they're not or their behaviour is not cool. Uh, and that's just a way of them expressing themselves in the environment that they're finding themselves in. So anyway, let's move on to what we're talking about today. A uh, couple of news things. Um, it is the 18th of October, um, so I'm going to Australia in a few weeks' time, uh, three weeks' time, two, three, three weeks' time, uh, we've got two seminars, uh, it was supposed to be two, uh, three, but there's two seminars, we're doing one in the Melbourne area, and that's the weekend of the 8th of November, and then the following weekend we're in the Sydney area, so if you're in Melbourne or Sydney or anywhere in between there, or fancy travelling to uh join us for a seminar those weekends then please do get in touch you can give me feedback uh, on the podcast you can email me info at glasgodogtrainer.co.uk it's always nice getting emails uh, from people uh, telling them telling us how much they appreciate uh, the podcast and how much they enjoy it and i do appreciate and i try to answer every single one that we can and uh, you can reach me on Facebook or Instagram as well, at Glasgow Dog Trainer. And we've also got, you might be listening to this on YouTube. We've got a big YouTube channel. We've got um, several hundred videos on YouTube, as well as Facebook and Instagram. That's also at Glasgow Dog Trainer. Um, if you can subscribe uh, to the channel as well, wherever you're listening to this podcast, if you can subscribe. And if you're in iTunes, please re- leave us a review. So that's that out of the way. A couple of things I want to talk about today. Um, some nice stuff today. Okay, you, uh, sometimes we can be have uh, the horror story, the horror story that can be dog training and people's interactions with their dogs. But if you're listening to this, then it's generally you're on the right path. So thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, dog trainer and dog professional green flags today, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. And I just wanted to give you some insight into a dog I'm working with just now. So the situation with this little dog they rescued the dog he's only um, he probably weighs about eight or ten kilos little terrier cross and he is uh has been something's happened to this dog before either poor socialization and uh, so that's the best that's happened to him or there's been some sort of abuse or neglect but he's just a little uh, dog who is can be frightened and sensitive to a lot of things in the environment and one of the things uh, the uh, woman uh, who owns him is retired she's two adult sons uh, dog, uh, let's call him Benji. So Benji loves one of the sons and really dislikes the other one. So we're trying to work on him getting better with the younger son. Uh, we're going to call him Charles. Uh, and because Charles uh, visits his mum often. So we visit, We did a, a session a couple of weeks ago and uh, Benji rarely came out of the downstairs bedroom, which is where he spends most of his time if Charles is in the house. Charles is a big man. He's six foot or six foot one. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, kind of uh, about himself, uh, I would describe uh, this man. He's a he's a cool guy, uh, but Benji doesn't like him. So what we did for what we've done for the last few weeks um, is uh, several times throughout the day, uh, what's happened is Mum uh, Morag will call her. Uh, Morag has uh, any time uh, Benji has been settled in the house, she just goes up and puts a treat down. Uh, and what we're doing there is we're actively reinforcing the calm, settled behaviour any time that we find this. So this is a, a great exercise for you to do with your dog. A, a phenomenal exercise is to catch the moments where your dog is calm and relaxed and actively reinforce those. You just mark it, good boy, good dog, good girl, 
and you go and get a treat and you put the treat down where the dog is. Now, at the first, what will happen is when you start doing this, the dog will, may follow you to uh, the where the treats are. They might follow you to the fridge or they might follow you into the living room, uh, wherever you treat, keep your treats in the container. Take the treat out and then put the treat back where the behaviour initially occurred. So if your dog was lying down on the mat or on the couch or on their bed and they get up to follow you, take that treat and put it back on that uh, on the couch or on the bed where they were initially. And if we do this as a pattern, what will happen is the dog will stop getting up because they realise when they are settled and you say, good dog, and you go for the treat, that you will bring it to them. So all the other uh, effort from them is unnecessary and they'll just wait for you to bring them a cup of tea in bed effectively okay kind of breakfast in bed if you like so we bring the, the, the treat to the dog okay so we're actively building a base of relaxed behaviors so that's what we're doing there okay now we did that for the last couple of weeks okay so that's what we did in the in the, mean, the interim what we did in the first session was uh, we approached uh, Benji was in the downstairs bedroom and um, I would get up several times, I would walk towards the threshold of the door, I would throw a few treats in and I would leave, okay, and then uh, uh, Charles did that as well, okay. So basically what we said to this little dog is, when I come towards you, good things happen. Those treats are there for you or not, it is up to you whether you want to take them, okay. So we put a few treats down on the uh, carpet and uh, then I would get... Um, Morag to go up and have a look and she would just uh, peek her head around the corner to see if uh, Benji had jumped off the bed and eaten those treats which she was doing most of the time okay so he was safe to eat the treats felt safe to eat the treats when we left okay which was really 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 nice really nice okay so we started building this as a pattern and that's all that we wanted to do I approach you good things happen I leave so the dog is getting two things that they want in this moment they're getting the good food and they're also getting you to leave. Okay, so imagine you've got somebody that you do not like and every time they approach you, they put £50 or $50 down on your desk and then they leave. Okay, and you do not have to do anything for that. Okay, they just approach you, put that money down and then leave. It's going to start changing your uh, opinion of that person gradually. Okay, it might be just little increments, little by little by little, and you start going, that person's okay. Okay, because they are safe, because they leave, they don't try and interact with me, uh, which is what I want, and they give me good things, which is also what I want. Now, what happens as we're doing this, the dog now start, stops, we, we get a change come somewhere along the line, where the dog now no longer wants us to leave as much. So they still might want us to leave, but they just don't want us to leave with the same degree of wanting to leave itness as they did before, okay? So our next stage from that is we approach the dog and if the dog is quiet and or looks at us, okay, um, so if the dog is quiet or the dog is quiet and looks at us, we put a couple of treats down and then we leave. So what we've now started to do, say is there is a, a, a tiny, easy condition for you to get that treat from me, which is you just remaining quiet and looking at me. Okay, now if the dog continues to bark at that stage, we just go back to stage one. Okay, all right, so you just go back and do more at stage one before you try that again. So, what we now do is uh, we've got the dog now settled and looking at us, so we've got some orientation towards us. We put the treats down and then we leave again. Now, what can happen? We've got a couple of options from here. We go further towards the dog, put the treat down, and leave. So, we're starting to desensitize the dog to our approach. Or we see if the dog will approach us. Okay, so what she what he might do is Benji might sit up in the bed, or he might stand in the bed, or he might jump down. Okay, so we do this again, and what you're doing is little by little you're seeing can you approach me or allow me to approach you. Now, if we approach the dog and we get more um, shying away behaviours, we back off a few stages. Okay, so we just take a couple of uh, dial that down a few notches and see cool right i'm recognized that you're not that comfortable with me approaching you at that, at that proximity so we'll just go back a few stages what also happens with this and you need to be careful when you're if you're working with this with your own dog eh, or you know a dog that you're working with is that it's not linear so you might have really good days 
and you might have not so good days. So Morag today, we had a really nice session, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, she said to me, well, what happens if he's not having a good, as good a day tomorrow as he had today? And I says, well, we'll deal with that. Okay, we just, we just meet the dog where they are in that moment. And as long as you keep doing this, the dog will make progress over time. If we're do doing it really cleanly with um, kindness, good ethics and consideration for the dog's welfare and not putting pressure on the dog to try and rush this or I need to be able to touch you within a certain time frame or approach you within a certain time frame. Okay, These time frames are ours. They're just made up by us. The dog doesn't care about them. Okay, well, They care about them if we're putting pressure on them. Okay, so that's what we did in our first session and that's what they've been working on in the last couple of weeks. So what did we did today was we went into the, the downstairs bedroom and Hamish jumped off the uh, bed and then he didn't race but he didn't walk. Okay, so he just kind of halfway in between there. He jumped off the bed and went into the living room and what he was basically saying to uh, Charles is, I don't want you in this room. <laughs> okay, you come in here, I'm leaving. Okay, that was fine. So we then, uh, he went into the living room and went into his uh, bed in the far corner and we did exactly the same again. Charles stood up, threw a couple of treats towards him and sat back down. Okay, we did this, a few repetitions of this. He now stood up, with, we threw a few treats towards uh, Benji and put a couple of treats, extra treats out of the bed to see if when Charles sat down, would Benji get out of his bed and take those treats, which he did. I did, Bill. Uh, was lying in her bed. She's starting to dig the bed up. I'm just asking her to lie down. Okay, so, um, yeah. So to see if, if we are remain seated, will Benji get up and get out of his bed to get that treat? Okay, so we did that super gently. So we've made some nice progress in those two weeks. Uh, last session, the dog wouldn't even come into the room with us. And if we'd have gone into the room, I don't think the dog would have left. I think he would just have stood there barking at us. Okay, so we made some nice progress. What did we do then? Took the dog out for a walk. Okay. One of the things that you, it's good to do with dogs who are fearful uh, of uh, other, thing, other things, okay, so people and other dogs, if they're fearful without the big, loud, explosive reaction, one of the good things to do is to try and build some experience with them where they're doing well anywhere, anyway, and we just drop in a little bit or some of the thing that they're not uh, great with. So what we did was we took, Morag took um, Benji out for a walk, and then Charles and I just joined him, and we went out for a walk. So Benji likes the walk when he's out and about, okay? We slowed the um, walk down, and we put him on a six-foot lead rather than a three-foot lead, so he's got room to explore. And... Charles and I just came up and joined and the, the four of us went for a short walk. We were out for about 10 or 15 minutes. Now, what I asked Charles to do was just look out the side of his eye and just kind of little glances, relax body language and wait to see if Benji would look up at him and pay him any attention at all. When he did that, Charles would, good boy, and take a treat and then just kind of pitch the treat down towards um, Benji's feet. Okay, so we started to do that. So uh, so one of the reasons why Benji's looking at him is it might be good things are starting to happen when you're here, okay, because you're starting to be a treat dispenser and I quite like sausages. And the other thing is I actually have to keep my eye on you to see whether or not I want you in my space or not. What are you going to do? Are you going to come too close towards me that I need to move away from you? Or are you just being cool and being there? Okay, so we build up that confidence in the dog and our behavior and what we are doing. Okay, so we become as reliable as possible. Several times throughout the walk we stopped and what I did was I stood there, uh, I asked um, Charles to take a treat, just bend down, offer it to Benji. Okay, if Benji approached us immediately and took the treat, he took the treat out of our hand. If he didn't take the treat, sorry, approach us immediately for the treat, Charles would toss the treat towards Benji's feet and then take two, stand up and take two or three steps back. Okay, so again, we're going back into that same ritual of the treat is yours, whether you want to approach me or not, and I will back off and let you uh, eat it. Okay, so really, really nice. And again, it's on Benji's time scale. 
Okay, I was going to use the words that's on his terms there, but then we start getting into some sort of negative kind of, oh, it's on the dog's terms and it's not on my terms. Yeah, just relax, man. Okay, <laughs> okay, just on his time scale. Okay, um, and agenda's not even the right word. Ah, but dog's got an agenda, and he absolutely doesn't because he's a dog. Okay, <laughs> okay, so we started doing that a little bit. Now, think of this with yourself. If somebody that you do not like offers you their hand to shake, Okay, or if you offer your hand to shake somebody's hand, if they see you offering your hand for a handshake and don't immediately move into your space and go to take your hand, they do not want to shake your hand. And this gap, when I say immediately, it is it's less than half a second. Okay, it's like it's such a short period of time, but it is perceptible. Okay, um, perceivable, perceptible. We offer to shake our hand, okay? Now, if we hold our hand out there, even for that, you know, we're approaching a second or a second and a half, we are now starting to put social pressure on that person who does not want to shake our hand, to shake our hand, okay? I think we've become, I think we've become so desensitised to our own behaviour and others' behaviour, others' behaviour, that we lose sign of lots of this subtleness, okay, or subtlety rather. Uh, and if we clue in on it and you really pay attention, you can see these really nice signs, okay, really, really, really cool, okay, somebody turning slightly away from you, okay, or moving slightly into your space, okay, you know, and it, it, how they move into your space and how they move away from you, okay, so we've got all of those things going on. So we got some really nice work done with this little dog today. I just wanted to share that with you because uh, uh, I try and give you some, hopefully try and give you some um, things that you can work on with your own dog. If your dog is not, if you've got a dog who is robust, just try and build some of these in. Look for these things, okay? So if you pick up your dog's lead, okay, and the dog pauses, they might just need a second and then they might come towards you, okay? So if to go out for a walk. Um, if you go to pet the dog or ask your dog to move, just give the dog a second, you know, say, I'm going to move, pal, and you shift your body weight very slightly if your dog's leaning against your, is sitting on you, and you're giving the dog an opportunity to respond to your initial movement, rather than just saying, I'm doing this, I'm going to do this, I'm doing it, and I don't, you don't have a chance to respond, and I'll just bulldoze through my behaviour through yours, okay, and not give you a chance to respond to it. So there's ways that we can take these things, lots of this, stuff and apply it to our own um, situation. I did a, pod, uh, a recording with somebody recently and we were, uh, it'll be out in a few weeks and we were talking about um, uh, some husbandry behaviour, so kind of grooming practices and things like that and it was on a different species. It's I'm always conscious of people will listen to that and start switching it off because they'll say, well that's a llama and it's got nothing to do with me and my dog. Yeah, but the principles are entirely, uh, are, are the same. Okay, the principles are, are, are universal. So we can apply uh, the nuance of it might be slightly different. The motivation of the animal might be slightly different or how they express that might be different. But the, um, the things are the same. Okay, the, the principles are exactly the same. So hopefully that's been useful. Okay, so moving on to, we'll do a few of these okay, uh, green flags. So the question I asked was, um, dog trainer or dog professional green flags? What things should people look for when they are selecting a dog trainer, behaviour consultant, groomer, dog walker or dog boarder, uh, which tell that person or business that the person or business is safe and has the animal's welfare at their utmost priority? Now, there's a lot in that question in and of itself. I'm going to talk a bit more about the dog trainer stuff here, but I just wanted to look at what people's thoughts were on that. Um, take some critical analysis and knowledge. Okay, so... Um, I get somebody phoning me today uh, for an inquiry. What they want and what I am willing to provide are two different things. Okay, so they wanted me to come in and sort their dogs out, and the reason why their dogs are a mess is because they have not put in the necessary time, uh, effort, or energy into dealing with their dogs. Okay, so one of the dogs isn't house trained. There is nothing I can do about them tra house training their dog other than to ride them a house training schedule okay i i am not there even if i was there for two hours a day morning and evening uh, or morning and afternoon that's still 22 hours a day that they are not there and 
so you saw how, how that was, the, the, we were at odds, and I, I basically said to this person, I don't think that we're a good fit from you from what you're describing, and I tried to be as diplomatic as possible, but we can't, you know, sometimes it's just not a good fit, and hopefully they'll, they'll get a, a positive trainer somewhere else, but I actually doubt it from um, what they were suggesting, and, and my view is that that person should not have those, those dogs, okay, they're not taking care of their dog's needs, okay. All right, so we need some some knowledge, some critical analysis of this thing. So we'll go through a few of these, okay? All right, so someone says, I make it clear that we're on their side. So this, this person's a dog trainer, okay? That we have the dog's back and we support the dog. Uh, uh, comfort and teamwork are priorities. Um, now, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're supporting the dog. Um, I, I, I'll pick up a little bit on that so they've said it make it clear that we're on the dog side okay if we think of if we can try and reframe this into it's a cooperative thing yes absolutely and you know from if you've listened to this podcast for a while or certainly from the preamp or the, the first part of this episode when I was talking about uh, uh, Benji that little dog yes it is theirs it is we are on the dog side but that doesn't mean that but we must be on the person's side as well and we're going to try and bring the person over to having some, maybe some, some more empathy or uh, um, understanding of the dog's viewpoint as well. Okay, so uh, I, I'm always, I'm, if you've been listening to me for a while or you've followed me for a while, I'm always, always, always aware of the language that we're using. Um, and I don't want to be saying, so what you're saying is <laughs> one of those guys when that's nothing like what they've said. So I, I don't doubt from this person who has commented, has said that they're on the dog side. I don't think that that means that we're not on the person's side, okay? But we just have to be clear in our language, I think. Uh, we have the dog's back, yeah, but we also have the person's back. Comfort and teamwork are priorities. Yes, they are. However, okay, learning, learning something new or challenging yourself into a new emotional frame is uncomfortable how we do that with what support do we do that um how how do we ease into the the boundary of that com comfort zone um and gently in order to gently expand it and then back off and allow ourselves to rest and recuperate and then come back again into it so yes comfort is a priority but if it's the absolute priority we will never make any progress okay um anything any any endeavor worth worth its uh, its salt um, requires some sort of discomfort in some way. Okay, I remember when I uh, I had a, a big lift on my, uh, the gym, one of the, a big one of the, the the lifts, and I wanted to reach. Um, so it was a bench press, and I wanted to. I'd never been able to go over a hundred kilos on my bench press. Uh, yeah, that was that was some work. Yeah, it took it. It took some work uh, for me to be able to get there, and it took about six weeks of work, uh, and and was uncomfortable. There is nothing pleasant, <laughs> or easy, uh, or comfortable when you're building up to those those weights. The more you practice it, the easier it becomes. But it's still always heavy, and the reason why it's heavy is because it's a big, massive weight. But the reason we do this is in order to get stronger. Okay, so we then become comfortable or better at lifting heavy things and it's the same thing with this okay we become better at dealing with the discomfort of life okay so yeah some nice points there okay uh light um now from this person uh looks like a trainer okay but the, it's a scandinavian um name all right and i'm i'm just being discreet with people uh when they've commented it's for no other reason than I don't want to bash anybody. Scandinavian name, and they've said licensed and educated from a force three free ethical science based academy. Okay, yes. Now, I know in Sweden, um, pretty sure in Sweden, their, their ethical standards are better, but I don't know if it is it licensed by the government, whereas here it's not licensed by anything. Okay, or in quotes, licensing bodies. Anybody could just set one of those up and call themselves a licensing body, okay, and call themselves an education provider. So this came up a few times. Um, the person has to be qualified uh, and, um, yeah, qualified uh, by one of the academies uh, here in the UK. It's the same as in the US. 
uh, yes and no. Okay, it's a standard of something. Okay, uh, and it is a standard of something. But what we also have to realise is that these are businesses, and businesses, uh, the job of a business is to make money. That's why it's there. There are other things, but businesses don't work unless they make money. They, you know, they just don't. Otherwise, it's a non-profit beyond that. Um, so, licensed and educated from a four-free ethical uh, academy based on science. Yeah, that's it's glorious. Uh, I just don't know how realistic it is, um, but it's certainly a standard to work towards. Yeah, so I think that, that's a good one. Okay. Um, someone has then said recommend, recommendations from trusted friends, seeing the trainer in action and talking to the trainer. Okay, talking to the trainer. We'll go look at that one first. If you're not educated and you don't know what your starting point is, I was speaking to the guy Charles today actually, because he was we're, we're talking about. I said, do you like this little dog? Do you like Benji? And he was honest and he says, not really. Um, there's another dog in the family that visits and he really likes this dog. But he likes the the other dog, uh, Marcy, let's call her, because Marcy plays with him. So he's getting a lot out of those interactions, okay? Uh, whereas he's not getting much out of the interactions with Benji. And it, it, it's a shame, okay? It's, it's just it's not a, an ideal situation. Now, what I said to him was, he, he works, you know, people facing. And I said to him, have you ever met somebody <laughs> that on initial greeting you do not like? But as soon as you start getting to know them, you do like them. So there's a guy I used to work with in the police. <laughs> right. Um, I'll just mention his name, right, because I love the guy dearly, right? And I think uh, he, his wife might listen to our podcast, and I'll not mention his surname, okay? But it's Craig, right? <laughs> Craig was one of the driest guys I've ever met in my life. And see, the first time I met him, I thought he was so rude, right? I just thought he was rude, standoffish, a bit weird. And then I started getting to know him, and, he's, and you can hear, I mean, you can hear the fondness I have of him and, and for him in my voice. He was a riot of a man, so funny, and a brilliant cop as well. Really, really genuinely like this guy. He used to work at the airport, um, uh, kind of the kind of counter-terrorism side, and I would see him standing sometimes when I was coming back from various uh junkets you know so he'd come back for someone and he'd be standing there him and another cop that I used to work with and be standing in their suits and every time I saw him my face lit up because I was like awesome there's Craig okay so that's a good example of having an initial uh, interaction with somebody and being wrong about it okay because not all of us are brilliant about this all the time very few of us are great about it all the time and lots of us aren't very good at it at all okay so we've got somebody, so this is talking to the trainer, okay? We've then got those people who are likable at first, but then when you start getting below the surface, um, they're not a likable person. And I always think that those people are charming, okay? So now they could be charming and a great person and really funny and, you know, all those awesome things, or they can be charming and they're charming because they're actually trying to charm you like a snake charmer, okay? Um, so talking to a trainer... Uh, and we've got a couple here, and they've got they have they're good salespeople. Uh, they can they can sell their product because they tell people what they want to hear. And uh, unless people are educated into asking the right questions, what training methods do you use? Okay, will you use a prong collar or a shot collar on my dog? Will you use a a a, a, a garrot or noose or slip lead to tighten round my dog's neck? If you don't know how to if you don't know about the, that training method, you'll not know how to answer that question. And what these people might turn around and say is, yep, what we'll do is we teach your dog how to do as well and we keep the dog within boundaries using certain techniques. Okay, now that's that's that could be horribly euphemistic for we're going to put a prong call on your dog. Okay, all right. So that that's um, we, we can be charmed or sold um, things. All right, uh, and the, the more that you be around these people, uh, the more that sorry, the more that you are around these people and are aware of these things, it's starting to look for uh, that that person's not all that, or not all what they seem to be. Okay, so talking to the trainer isn't necessarily a good, isn't necessarily a green flag. I don't think. Okay, seeing the trainer in action, that's another one which I would probably take some sort of have some sort of disagreement with. Again. Unless you are educated and know what you're looking for, um, so there was a there's a guy uh, trainer 
um, and he's got a big social media following, okay, um, and the the aversion, the abuse, the harsh treatment of the dogs is so. There's several of them actually, okay. It's not. Um, there's several of them that I've seen. It's so subtle that if your eye is not trained, you would not notice it, okay. So if you know what you're looking for, you will see it. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you will not see it because they're not grabbing the dog and swinging the dog around their head like a helicopter on a choke chain or a prong collar, okay, or really harsh corrections or kicking the dogs in the ribs, okay. And then even with that, Caesar Milan corrected dogs on the neck and kicked them in the ribs at the same time, and he did that forever, and people still bought into it and still buy into it the notion that he is just, in quotes, snapping the dog out of their frame of mind. No, he, no, he's not. He is kicking the dog in the rib, not even in the ribs, it's in the soft part between the last rib and the pelvis, okay, that really sensitive part in your in your waist, okay, and pulling the dog in on a, on a slip lead, okay, or a prong collar. So seeing the trainer in action is not necessarily a green flag if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, I feel as if I'm giving this person an awful hard time for it three things that they suggested they also suggested recommendations from trusted dog friends okay um i was a trusted dog friend 20 years ago because i had dogs and i was still using prong collars and and choke chains so um again you have to know does that person know anything are they qualified to give an opinion on anything do their ethics align with mine okay so there's a a, a, a lot of things there which um, yeah, that looks great. Okay, I'll read that. What the person said again: recommendations for trusted dog friends, seeing the trainer in action, and talking to the trainer. On the surface, that looks awesome. Okay, on further examination, I don't think so much. Okay, um, but it, it's but I'm always grateful for people to um, comment on my stuff. So please, if you've commented on that, and I dare say that the person who's commented on that has been ethically aligned with me okay but it, what i'm trying to do in this uh, episode is talk to people who may not know other things okay or may not know what we know okay okay moving on someone who listens carefully to them who um, initially ignores their nervous dog and does not try to pet them okay lovely yep listen to the client what are they saying what are the what's the problem okay now there's a uh yeah really nice stuff, and doesn't try and interact with the dog, so that's me to a T. I bring the person out first, bring out a car, or I've done the conversation on the phone before we meet, and I ask them what's going on with their dog before we bring the dog out. When they bring the dog out, yep, I don't try and interact with that dog, unless the dog is, you know, jumping all over the top of me in a friendly way, in which case I will say hi to the dog to try and settle, settle them down. Okay. Uh, someone who uses phrases like let's take things slowly and at your dog's pace there are no guarantees or quick fixes but we will try x y excuse me x y or z okay yep awesome all really really nice things yep uh, and again uh, a level of critical analysis involved in that um uncertainty kindness and patience are green flags for me i don't know so much about uncertainty okay um I am certain with my clients that we can make improvements, okay? The improvements that we can make might not be what they want, okay? They might, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is people often, and it's it's rare, okay, but it does, it's not so rare. People want me to sort the problems out um, and don't want to change the, themselves or their views, okay? So I, I'm not uncertain in that. I'm certain that if they change their views and change some of their behaviour, they could change their dog's behaviour, Okay, um, I don't guarantee outcomes though, um, but I don't th I, I don't think that ne necessarily feeds feeds it feeds into uncertainty. Okay, um, a sense of humour uh, and a delight in all dogs things all dog things are cherries on the cake. Yep. Okay, and hopefully I've got I've got an awesome sense of humour, don't I? <laughs> right. Okay. Science based education, clear ethical guidelines, and and being empathetic. Yep, that's awesome. Yep. Okay. Um, next one, being honest about one's limitations. Just because we're a professional in the field doesn't mean we know everything or have experienced everything there is. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing when to refer on, that's also a good one. However, um, if people are not referring on, it might be because there's people that are uh, 
there aren't any other suitable people in the area qualified. Okay, that's one thing. And the other thing is, and from a business point of view, uh, there has to be quid pro quo. Okay, so if you're referring people to others and you never get anything back, yep, we, we could take bite the bullet. Okay, but you're you're feeding people's livelihood uh, to potentially to the detriment of your own. Okay, so that, that, there's some other things going on there. Okay, and again, when I was asked in the initial post, uh, engaging a doctrine and professional, so we have to be aware of these things. Okay, right. Um, Okay, a great communicator for board, both dogs and their humans. Yep. Now, I, I would maybe say a good communicator, or certainly working on their communication skills. Okay, so that that's but that's that's some nice stuff there. Um, so they said a client who has agor agoraphobia or agoraphobia uh, and a disability had a surprise puppy given to him by her son. Her husband wanted to uh, uh, return the puppy, by the end of the course of lessons, the husband shook my hand and said that he sees me as a support worker who guided his wife into a positive place in their life and she felt empowered to be able to look after the puppy, leave at home and uh, talk to strangers. Okay, so that that's a great outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's some nice, a, a, a good communicator. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You've got to put your client at ease and you've got to communicate what you want. It's really, really nice. Uh, next one. They understand that feeling safe and being safe are not the same thing. Okay, now that's as a standalone statement. I'm going to um, look a little bit further at that. Okay, we have to take people's feelings into account. Okay, we do. We absolutely do. So if somebody feels that they're not safe, that's their perception of it. Okay, um, but feelings aren't always reality. Okay, and if we are looking to push a dog further, or sorry, push a dog gently into the boundary of their comfort zone in order to expand that comfort zone, then we are asking the person to perhaps give up their absolute sense of safety um, for their dog's benefit. Okay, so that's as much as I kind of want to say about that. Okay. A good, calm solution finder with no aversives uh, is open and honest. And not everything is going to uh, go right, so we always have to have a plan B. Okay, The honesty thing, yes and no. <laughs> okay, right, so um, in my previous job, we, we could pretty much say what we wanted when we wanted, Okay, and there was little repercussion. So it's how cops communicated with each other. It's, it's just a hideous how they communicate with each other. Um, I remember um, my brother was a cop uh, uh, as well, and he said he would go in. He went into when he worked in uniform, and there was an old cop. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not laughing. I'm laughing at how ridiculous this is. The probationer, the, the rookie, comes in, and he's standing there, and he was a mouth breather. Okay, so he would, you know, sit there with this gormless look in his face, with his mouth open. Okay, now I get. That's not a very professional look, okay, and it's not, all right, um, and the old cop just got into this guy, you know, and started, I mean, was savage with this guy, so you have to develop this, this really thick skin, okay, now, he is, the older cop is being honest, yeah, just not really kind, yeah, and there's, a, there's somewhere in between there. Okay. Can you be kind and honest? Yep. Can you be kind and dis sorry? Can you be kind and dishonest? Mm, don't know so much about that one. Can you be uh, unkind and honest? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So that brutal honest. Let me be brutally honest with you. Well, how about you just be honest with you without the brutality? Thanks very much. So we would speak to each other like that, and then because we had the authority of the state behind you, you could pretty much speak to the public like that if you were so inclined. Okay, so honesty, uh, is honesty always the best policy? Maybe, yep. Yep, certainly towards looking towards having an honest picture about it. But if you see somebody making a mistake, uh, you can honestly say that they've made a mistake, but they might be learning. All right, so um, open and honest, yep. Open, certainly open to, to having an open heart, yep. Um, 
open to an ethic, a change in ethical standards? No, absolutely not. All right, but I get what, what, what we're saying. Yeah, a CAM solution finds it with no aversives. So that's the previous part, okay? Open and honest. If we qualify it with the first part, then that's some nice stuff. Okay, let's move on to, we'll do one more. In fact, we'll do a couple more, okay? Uh, always working from the dog's perspective. We talked about that before, okay? I don't think always I'm... I'm I was just about to say there, I'm always careful of using the word almost, never, okay, should, and so on. Uh, always is sometimes a dangerous word, okay. We have to have an awareness of the dog's perspective, but we also have to look at sometimes we might have to yield a little bit on that if the person's trying to learn, or is this good enough? Yep, and sometimes, yeah good enough is good enough and it might not be ideal and it might not be what we want with our dog or the life that we've got with our dog but the alternative alternative might be even more hideous okay um or just hideous okay uh, a relaxed demeanor yeah maybe okay um a good sense of humor is nice yeah absolutely because that helps um uh, break the tension okay an unwavering commitment to gentle dog-friendly methods. I would agree with that. Many years of experience with positive reinforcement training is good. Uh, maybe, okay, but it's the age-old thing of um, you need experience to get this job. How do I get experience if I can't get the job? Okay, if, if nobody will give me a job. All right. Um, uses all positive things as reward. Food, toys, games, and activities the dog loves. Yeah, so there's lots of, lots of nice things in there. Okay, um, and I'm I'm not deliberately disagreeing with these things. I'm just kind of running through them, some sort of analysis. Okay, well, last one. Uh, I've asked what happens when the dog does something wrong, or I'll ask something pertaining to uh, being alpha or world domination, and their answers tell me a lot. Starting to move into less green flags there. Okay, um, but the green flags there would be if the dog does something right, we reassess why they did something wrong in quotes. And then we try and set it up that it doesn't happen again. Um, if you send something about alpha or um, these types of things, dog trying to be the boss, uh, we can, if they dispel those things, then that, that's good as well. Okay, so we'll leave it there today, guys. Uh, again, massive thanks for listening to uh, Hopefully this has been useful. A wee bit of a mixed bag today. Yeah, I've got a couple of these more to do uh, as well. It's always nice uh, if you're engaging with me on, it's mainly Facebook, but if you see my stuff on Facebook, because it gives us stuff to talk about, hopefully I can put, run it through my uh, critically analytical filter, and then that will help you do the same, uh, or you'll take something that I've said and then analyse it and go, maybe I don't agree with that, and then you get back to me and hopefully we can have a discussion about it or get you on the podcast and we have a chat about it. Much love to you. Hope to see you in Australia uh, and uh, I'll catch you in the next one.